Hi, it's Jan Beta, and this is the Atari 1040 STF that you saw me do some work on the electronics in the last video. And as you can see, it is fully functional. Uh, the video output quality looks very nice. There's no noise in there like we had with the old power supply. This is now uh, like a very pristine looking uh, picture, so that definitely made sense. We also replaced the capacitors and I tried to fix the drive. Many people asked me if I tried the old drive with the new power supply. Uh, yes, I did. I didn't um, put that in the last video, but uh, I tried it and it didn't work. It did just the same as it did before, so I uh, didn't read discs. I'm going to look into that in another video, I guess. Uh, this video is going to be about the optical side of things, more or less. So, while this is completely working, and uh, yeah, working very nicely as far as I can tell, I didn't try that many things yet, um, the case is pretty yellow and there's some pretty nasty dirt on here. So that's what I'm going to be concerned with in this episode. Uh, there's probably going to be more videos about this at some point, but for this video I'm going to do uh, a good cleaning of this thing and I will attempt to retrobrite it because it's severely yellowed and I have quite some experience with retrobrite. Um, the Mega ST that probably is made of the same material that has exactly the same color which is not the beige or white that we know from the Amigas for example. It is rather like a bright gray kind of color like this color here. Um, so it's pretty difficult. I heard many people had severe problems retrobriting these because they just turned out uh, like with streaks and uh, or too bright or something like that. I usually found that if you go slowly with my method that works pretty well. I had some backlash with uh, some very dark keys on an Atari 800XL that I tried it on. But yeah, that, that was a very dark color. On the Atari Mega 1 or Mega ST that I did a refurb of a while back, it worked very well. So um, this is the color we are aiming for. This is like a bright gray tone. And this was very yellow and it still... I don't know how long it was ago that I did it, but it still looks pretty much as good as new. So um, that worked very well and the, I didn't get any streaking or very, very uh, subtle streaking that I didn't notice at all. So uh, yeah, that's kind of promising. I think I want to try the same method on this one. Uh, but first of all, let's take it apart and clean the case parts. Uh, I didn't really fully reassemble this, so this is an easy uh, thing to do. So no screws in there and stuff, because I knew that I wanted to do this. We of course have to do um, some work on the keyboard too. Bottom part is not that bad, actually. <laughs> We're still going to do some work on this. First of all, I think I want to get rid of the sticker residue. And uh, one of the big retro computer YouTubers, uh, namely the 8-bit guy, has a method of just using WD-40. I tried this on various things. Uh, that are not retro computer related and it worked really well. I've never tried it for removing one of these from a retro computer yet, but he does all the time, so I guess uh, I'll give it a go. So I let this soak for a while in uh, WD-40 and I've had really good results um, for jobs like these with uh, using a guitar pick or plectrum to just lightly scrub stuff. Uh, which isn't damaging the plastic that much, or at least not as, as much as I would it would be by using a uh, metal tool for this. Yeah, there you go. Maybe I need something more aggressive for this. Yeah, but it's, there we go. That's pretty much it. Okay. Okay, so that came off rather nicely. Uh, the rest, I'm just using alcohol. 
which is also good for removing like uh, glue residue and stuff like that. Oh, some parts not quite come up yet. And the thing you really want to do thoroughly is to clean things up before retro brighting it because uh, if you retro bright it with dirt on it, uh, yeah, it, it won't work. You get you get uh, stains where the dirt was basically that won't retro bright. So this has quite some discoloration, but I think I want to soak it in some soapy water and give it a good scrubbing, and that should do. That sticker is completely removed, I'd say. Okay, let's get this into some soapy water, but first of all I want to remove the keycaps from the keyboard and soak those too. So, by the way, the bottom case uh, isn't that bad at all. It just, it's not yellowed, but the back part is. And uh, this is pretty similar to what I saw with the Mega One, uh, where one side was severely yellowed and the other one was very uh, subtly yellowed only. But yeah, I hope this works as well as with, with the Mega. So, uh, I want to take the keycaps off. For that job I'm using my keycap puller that I always have handy on my desk here, because I usually do this uh, quite often. So I'm just going to get a container to put all the keys in, or the keycaps rather. Okay, let's just do this. And these come off rather nicely. I believe it's another mechanism than we had on the uh, Mega ST. This has like the cross similar to the uh, Amiga keys that I've worked on. There's different Amiga keyboards as well, but uh, I think the Mega keyboard had a different mechanism. Don't quite remember. I would I would have to rewatch my own video. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. So I got all the keycaps removed and as you can see this has some dirt on it and it's pretty, it's grimy. So I'm going to give this a good clean as well, but I'm going to soak the keys uh, in some soapy water first, I guess, together with the uh, top and the bottom half of the case. So I am using my beloved uh, Silibang. Uh, multi-fat solvent stuff and I'm just going to use lukewarm water pour some generous amount of this in here and let these keys soak for quite a while for like an hour or so usually so now I'm going to let this soak for an hour or two and uh, after that I will have each individual key um, scrubbed with a brush, with a toothbrush I think. And then rinse them with uh, like clean, clean water. And for the case we are just going to basically scale the same thing up to uh, this shower. And we're going to have stuff soak just like uh, the keys. There we go. Nice Atari bath. And so I'm going to leave this for one or two hours and then scrub it with a big brush. So the keys have been soaking for some time, the key caps, and now I'm going to scrub each individual one.
So now I'm going to put these uh, somewhere warm and just let them dry. And the same with the, uh, the case parts. Just going to leave them for a while to have them completely dry. And then I'm going over again with uh, some alcohol or some window cleaner or the like um, to have them completely free of any grease before we go on to retrobrite them. <laughs> okay, let's take care of the filthy uh, keyboard bracket. Uh, I'm using a toothbrush, some window cleaner and uh, alcohol isopropanol. There's a stuck key, I believe. Oh. Let's see if we can get that out. You might have a missing piece there. First of all, let's clean this up. It's filthy anyway. <laughs> So let's see if we can get this uh, key, which is pretty stuck, if we can get this out again. No, we can't. So I presume the rubber dome or the spring that's underneath here is missing. So yeah, let's, let's have a look and uh, disassemble this, I guess. And of course, there's quite some, some screws here on the back sides, yet we all have to... Get out. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> no way, no way around it, I guess. So there is uh, a piece of clear plastic, which is uh, sticky rather, yeah, I think it's glued on here, like sticky tape, but uh, a lot thicker. Um, I think I just can peel this. There's the screws are underneath there, so I can just yeah, I can just peel this so I can reach the screws, okay. I'll probably reattach it later without any problems. This is for, for um, insulation, I suppose. This bracket has to come off as well. At least I guess so. Yeah, there we go. There we go. This should now lift out. Ooh, look at that. Okay, and these are the classic rubber domes style keys. This doesn't look too bad, actually. But there might just be one of those rubber domes missing. Hmm. Yeah, there's one missing. Well, that's kind of unfortunate. <laughs> so the unfortunate thing is I can't really do much about this at this point. Except for maybe taking apart another keyboard. Yeah, I think I'm just going to do that. I have another Atari keyboard that might be the same, uh, that might have these domes. I think you can buy these domes uh, from somewhere. Probably I would look on eBay or something. These are standard uh, things, I guess, uh, more or less. So yeah, maybe I'll just have a look at the other keyboard, the other Atari ST keyboard I have and see if that has uh, the same kind of uh, little rubber domes. So here's how this works. There's a printed carbon trace there that closes as soon as this carbon or um, like carbon induced silicon closes the contact. So this is like this becomes a switch and when you push it the uh, little dome closes this contact here so it's a, it's a switch. That's how these work. Uh, widely used in game pads and stuff like that. Uh, so I definitely need something that can replace this rubber dome there. Or silicon dome rather. Yeah, so these are available from eBay uh, in packs of 10 from a seller in the UK. So yeah, I'm probably just going to order these for now because uh, this is going to take some time and it's not going to be here uh, in time 
for this video. I think I'm just going to take one out of another spare keyboard that I have that I don't use at the moment and that's in a much uh, worse state than this one. I'm just going to use one of those domes and buy these and then uh, yeah, replace the little rubber dome and the other keyboard again. So let me just uh, disassemble the other keyboard quickly and uh, get one of those domes out there and uh, see if that fixes our problem. So here's the other one and I managed to just unscrew uh, some of these screws and then get in with uh, this and take it out there. And now I have the missing uh, rubber dome for repairing my keyboard, which was nice. Okay, so I want to put these rubber domes on this side uh, so we can clean the PCB and then reassemble it nicely by uh, just laying the PCB on this thing here. We should probably put this this way around so we can have it easier to just uh, put the PCB on there. It's easier to see where which key goes. Okay, let's do this. I think, yeah, this works much better. We should uh, prop this up a bit so they can just um, fall into position there, which will work much better. Then we can put the PCB on there. That makes more sense. Okay, let me find something to um, just raise this by a centimeter or so, so that the plungers can uh, fall through their holes. <laughs> Ended up using two IDE hard disk drives that I had lying around, uh, as you do. So yeah, these are pretty well suited for the job, because they are pretty sturdy and heavy and uh, yeah. This gives me a solid uh, working area here. So let's get on with putting the rubber things on the plastic thing. <laughs> For cleaning the PCB, let me just use some alcohol, isopropanol, and a cloth. I'm not going to uh, use too much force because you can damage the uh, contacts there, which of course we want to avoid. I'm going to finish this with uh, my trusted uh, Teslanol contact and tuner spray, which is a very good uh, non-corrosive uh, contact cleaner. I'm just going to use that on another little piece of cloth here and wipe it over the contacts just like I did with the alcohol. And this, uh, this prevents further corrosion and is generally, I use this for everything, this stuff is really, really good. And it doesn't damage uh, contacts. It's made for cleaning uh, like potentiometers and stuff with carbon contacts in there. So this is a really good way of not damaging your hardware and still using some kind of contact cleaner. And this stuff also seals the contacts uh, with um, kind of an oily substance. I don't really know how it works chemically, but uh, it worked really well for me for the past years. So we've been using this for I don't know how many years now. And it always worked well. Okay, there we go. Time to put this on this. Carefully. It should go like this, shouldn't it? Yes, I think so. There we go. Okay, this should work pretty nicely. And I'm going to screw it in while it's still on my uh, stand there. So nothing gets dislocated.
Tada! <laughs> Okay, a lot better already, uh, looks a lot cleaner than before, and the plungers are all up. I noticed one other thing, this plunger here has a slightly different color than the others, so it might have been replaced previously uh, with a spare part. Interesting. Yeah, so I think it's time to do some retro brighting. Yay! Okay, let's go retro bright the case. Um, I am using this uh, cream, peroxide cream, hydrogen peroxide cream, 12%. I'm going to link this in the description and uh, there is others that work similarly as well, I know that. Uh, I've used this before and it worked very well for me. I'm also going to use the same stuff in uh, its liquid form. Uh, because that is more useful on keys, I found, because you don't get as much streaking on keys as with um, the cream stuff. For the case part, I've had good results with this uh, cream stuff that I just apply with a brush and then uh, use some cling wrap to wrap the stuff. And then afterwards I'm going to use the uh, box that I built in another video that you can see in the background there. Uh, which is basically just a big uh, cardboard box which has been lined with uh, aluminum foil, so it reflects a bit. I put the case parts inside, then I'm going to put my full spectrum light, uh, which is a grow light used for plants. I'm going to link that in below as well, the one I used, which works for me, and I'm going to put that on top and put the case parts inside and then come back every half hour and change the position of the parts and slightly massage the cream peroxide uh, back and forth so we get an even bright brighting, retro brighting process. Uh, this has worked for me numerous times. I know there's a lot of different uh, approaches to this. There's also the um, you just using sunlight and uh, or using sunlight in combination with peroxide. Uh, there is people using uh, these oxy products that you use to, to wash, your, uh, wash your clothes. Uh, that didn't work very well for me. I got a lot of streaking with that. Tried a couple of different methods. This is the one that worked for me the most reliably, so I'm going to uh, stick to this. And it usually doesn't take that much time. Uh, using this box and the extra light and stuff. You want to wear gloves for this because this stuff, uh, this peroxide stuff can be pretty aggressive on the skin, especially if you have uh, sensitive skin. And also you don't want this on your clothes because it basically is bleach. Not basically, it is bleach, so it's, it is going to remove the color from your clothes if you uh, get it on there. So. Be careful. Also your hair, of course. This is uh, like a, a product that is usually used on hair, for bleaching hair. So we are going to bleach an Atari today. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and just uh, going to do this. For applying this, this is a, and one important thing, I'm using like a paintbrush for applying the cream to the case there. So yeah, let's just go. So here comes my grow light, uh, which I'm just going to place on here and uh, put mains power to it and then let it run for a while. And as you can maybe see, this emits uh, like a pink light, which looks really nice. <laughs> 
So we're going to come back in half an hour or so and massage uh, the cream around and slightly change the positioning of the pieces. Yeah, and that's basically how you go about doing this. And usually after three hours, four hours, something like that, uh, you get very decent results. So let's see. Okay, and uh, this process just repeated until we get uh, reasonable results. Usually takes a couple of hours, as I said. So the keys are just going to go into a plastic bag and those are going to be uh, submerged in uh, liquid peroxide and then I'm going to use a little clip to close the plastic bag and uh, yeah, this should work just fine and I think I'm going to put these in with the keyboard for now uh, into my box and then later I'm going to use the grow light on this insulated, this is like bubble wrap that's, that has a, an aluminum uh, coating on it. Uh, I'm going to use the grow light directly on this because this will heat it up uh, as you will see when I do it. It will stay at exactly the temperature that uh, makes the retro writing process a lot quicker but will not damage the keys, <laughs> which is uh, a little under 60 degrees Celsius, I found. Um, the plastic starts to melt at around 60. Just putting this in the middle here. Okay, I'm just trying to um, put the this stuff here that is leaking the keys into this container, which should be uh, good without wasting any of the peroxide. Okay.
So now I'm going to uh, leave this off there. I'm still going to leave the uh, case parts in and uh, maybe come back with the light later. But for now I'm just going to put the keys that I conveniently have put into this container into this insulated container and put the light on top. So what this will do is to uh, have the UV light in there or the full spectrum light and also it's going to heat up uh, the insides of this box because it's insulated with this bubble wrap stuff uh, to very close to 60 degrees Celsius which would be the temperature where most plastics melt and uh, yeah from my experience this works pretty well on smaller case parts and gives me pretty sorry <laughs> gives me pretty quick results so and uh, for this method I'm doing pretty much exactly the same as with the other case parts turning this off and uh, just stirring things a bit so every key gets submerged equally and I can already see that uh, things are looking less yellow inside there it's pretty impressive, really. Okay, let's give this another half an hour. <laughs> okay, I think we're done here. And as far as I can see, the pieces turned out pretty nicely, actually. There's still a bit of a yellowish tint, but it's really subtle, and these are pretty much as good as new, I guess. So let's wash them. So it seems like the keys have turned out pretty nicely as well. They're a lot less yellow at least, so that's a good sign. <laughs> We're going to see when we have it all uh, dried. Just going to leave this to dry now and uh, also the case parts and then I'll see you when I'm reassembling it. So here comes my favorite part. The reassembly. Okay, keyboard turned out rather nicely, a lot better than before. Um, there are some keys that are slightly yellowed, I don't even know if you can see it on camera, but very slightly. So, and yeah, it definitely looks way better than before. It was quite unevenly yellowed and now it's pretty much pretty even. I can still, if I look very, very closely, I can still see some of these keys here are a bit more yellowed but it's way better than before. Okay, let's put the case back together. And as you can see, this turned out really nicely as well. Uh, there's some slight cloudiness like here, but it really looks way better than before. Uh, not much streaking going on and it's pretty much back to the original color, which you can see when you look at the inside of it. Um, there is this standoff that's broken off that is still uh, stuck on the screw here. We're going to glue that back on, I guess. 
Let's do that. So here's the spot where we want to affix this thing or broke off. And I'm cleaning this with some IPA isopropanol, which is 99% uh, alcohol. It should get rid of any residue that might be on there. And then we're going to see if this fits in there. It should. Okay, so it goes like this. There's one position where it fits perfectly, which is this. And we're going to use my uh, plastic model building glue that I used before for stuff like this. I'm using this stuff, which is probably you can use um, like acetone or something. I think this is just acetone based and it basically welds the plastic together by dissolving it. And then, yeah, when it dries, the plastic basically uh, becomes one piece of plastic. So let's see if we can put it on here. There we go, that should be it. Now we have to let it dry for a bit. Okay, I'm going to leave this to dry and to, to um, cure for, uh, I think it should be 10 minutes or something, but I'm going to leave this for a bit more to make sure it's completely dry. So it's actually quite a bit later because I had to get something to eat in the meantime and now this should be completely, totally cured. And in theory, yeah, it should be just as sturdy as if it was one piece of plastic. Or, yeah, which it was obviously, but now it should be back to the rigidity it had originally, basically. Okay, let's reassemble the case. So it got pointed out in the comments that the keyboard, if I put it on here, will be very close to the uh, hot mains voltages uh, on the power supply brick here because I put it in this way and not uh, like angled to this side or something like that. Uh, I am going to put some, some insulation there, uh, probably just going to use some electrical tape for now and yeah, let's just see how that goes. Okay, so this is going to do for now. Uh, I'm probably going to go back in here at some point and replace this with a proper piece of plastic or something like that. You can actually buy these from Meanwell, like a little protective strip that goes on there and, and clicks into place. But I don't have it. Um, I bought one one of these Meanwells a while back where it came with the little, uh, like a, with a clear plastic thing that you could put on there. And yeah, but this one didn't come with it, so I wasn't quite prepared for that. I, uh, long story short, I'm going to go in here again anyway at some point to have a look at the drive again and stuff like that. So I'm just going to leave it at that for now. It's better than, than no protection at all. And it's just like a, a double uh, safety measure anyway. So the keyboard. So the keyboard. And by the way, as I said in the electronics uh, episode of this, uh, the RF shield that is originally in here is not going to fit because it's too tight around the uh, power supply. But this is going to fit nicely. And there's like at least half a centimeter of room between the keyboard and the live wires here. So that's going to be fine even without insulation. But this makes it just, just a little bit... Uh, Nicer, I guess. Don't want to be electrocuted by your old Atari accidentally. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's put the top part on. Ah, now look at that. Okay. This looks a lot better than before.
By the way, while um, putting these screws in, I always turn a bit left until it clicks into place because these are cutting through the plastic basically. Uh, and if you turn them left until you feel it slides, it's slightly um, sliding into the cuts that had been cut before, you can just uh, screw them in so much easier and don't risk the plastic to break. Yeah, so much for the restoration of the case and the keyboard of this Atari 1040 STF. It looks nearly as good as new, I have to say. It turned out really nicely. It was quite significantly yellowed. You can really tell by um, the badge here, uh, the difference between the badge and the color of the case. And yeah, now it's pretty much back to its original color. It, matches the Mega ST that I have standing next to it here on my bench uh, quite well. So that is the original Atari color. I have to do some electronics work still on this, so there's probably going to be more episodes. The disk drive needs some more uh, attention. Some of you have pointed out that this might be a uh, single-sided drive, so it won't be able to read my double-sided Mega ST Atari discs that I made, uh, which makes sense, of course. So I'm going to test that in a another episode. For this episode, this is what I wanted to do. The case turned out pretty nicely. The keyboard looks nice, uh, got everything reassembled. So one last thing that I have to do to um, finish the case restoration. The rubber feet that are usually on here are gone. So I have to use these replacement ones that I have used quite a bit, as you can see, because they are standard size, 12.7 uh, millimeters uh, by 3.5 millimeters is what the size is, and these are useful for a lot of uh, most. I would I would dare say uh, most electronics uh, have the same size feet. The Amigas have the same size feet. These have this exact size, so we can just fit them in there. I guess originally these have a wide feet, but uh, yeah, I usually go with the black ones and uh, it is fine, I think, uh, if you have four black ones, it looks pretty original to me. Uh, I don't think these are available in white. I think you can get these in clear, uh, but I haven't seen white ones yet, so... And I just have the black ones, so I'm going with black ones. And that's gonna be alright. So that's a fully refurbished Atari 1040 STF. And yeah, it turned out pretty nicely, as you can see. Pretty uh, pleased with how this came out. And as I said, there's going to be more episodes, but this is going to be the last video for this year from me. So let me take this opportunity to just uh, thank you all for watching my stuff and for commenting and for giving thumbs up or down, which both is fine, obviously, because it uh, is a kind of feedback that I appreciate. And yeah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to do this and to learn from your comments and your input in your emails and stuff like that and for everybody who donated stuff to me be it uh, this Atari which got donated to me be it uh, your Patreon support be it uh, other support be it your support on my Twitch channel that I am uh, doing for quite a while now so if you don't know uh, I'm playing retro games on original hardware mostly on my Twitch, which you can check out. I'm going to link that below. It is also linked below every video, but uh, yeah, most people don't know that. And some, I always get people in the chat who are surprised that I'm actually doing uh, streams, but I do that. And I plan on doing that every week from now on. Also want to thank PCBWay. Uh, you can see this little package that they sent me for Christmas. I'm going to open that up now on video because, um, yeah, they are a very kind sponsor and I appreciate working with them really much. And they have these little Christmassy <laughs> ornaments that they send out that I'm going to put up on my Christmas tree 
my little <laughs> Christmas tree in my little flat here. So um, thanks everybody and have a very nice Christmas if you are celebrating Christmas at all. Uh, have a nice one. Have a nice new year. I'm going to be back in 2020. There is going to be an another video on my Patreon, probably. Uh, yeah, what else can I say? Thank you so much and see you next year. Thanks. Bye.